Nearly 400 children have been convicted of murder in the UK in the last two decades. The youngest was just 11 years old. I'm Leia Green, and I'm investigating Britain's most terrifying children to find out what drives kids to kill. The rising tide of violence amongst young people has spilled over into Britain's schools. Boys, oh, got no. He's got no. He's got no. The problem's getting worse. Each year, nearly 20,000 teachers are attacked by their pupils. In 2014, almost 1,000 pupils were caught by police in school with weapons, including a taser, a meat cleaver, three axes, and a cutthroat razor. The youngest was only eight. At 11.48am this morning, West Yorkshire Police were contacted by Yorkshire Ambulance Service who were attending a report of a member of teaching staff having been stabbed at Corpus Christi Catholic College. With the screaming, they said she tried to escape running into the corridor with Cornick pursuing her. This is a profoundly shocking, indeed absolutely appalling incident. We'll never be able to make sense of what happened uh, and how public it was. I'm investigating what drove a 15-year-old boy to kill his teacher in a frenzied knife attack in front of his whole class. And if this murder is a one-off event, or the symptom of a deeper-rooted problem. How vulnerable are British schools to an American-style massacre like Columbine, Virginia Tech or Sandy Hook? Can we identify the potential killers in our classrooms? I'll be hearing from those closely involved in this case. Could this boy be psychotic? Because it was an unexplained homicide. And it was only necessary that his lawyers should have investigated whether he was what you might want to describe as mad or bad. The um, uh, issue in the case was going to be his psychiatric state. There will always be examples of young people from a very early age who are going to be killers and nothing you can do will change that course. What can we learn from this horrific event? What we need to do is uh, have a serious uh, look into what could have been done to prevent it uh, and safeguard against it happening again. I'll be taking a psychopath test myself. I'm not sure how much it will help you in your life if you know that you're, you're more psychopathic than, than the general population. And meeting a teacher who survived an unprovoked knife attack in his own classroom. Then I turned around, he pulled his hand out. That's when I, I saw the long knife, almost six inch long, in his hand, you know, covered in blood. I'm on my way to Corpus Christi Catholic College in Leeds, where William Cornick killed his teacher, Anne Maguire. This is a good school on the outskirts of the city. I cannot even begin to imagine how scared these pupils must have been on the day of Anne Maguire's murder. I mean, I went to a pretty big school and there were quite a lot of fights and stuff, but it was never somewhere where I really felt unsafe and I definitely never feared for my life. I want to find out what led a model student like William Cornick to end up with a life sentence for the murder of Anne Maguire. In the months leading up to his trial, he is examined by one of the country's leading forensic psychiatrists. This is unprecedented, this case. Uh, um, you start to think, well, I'm not sure what's going on here. Could this boy be psychotic? Um, because it was an unexplained homicide. It was the first time a teacher had ever been stabbed in a British school and, and died. A young person with no known history of violence had acted with exceptional savagery in killing a teacher that he should have admired. The inexplicable killing of a much-loved teacher in her own classroom shocked the country. ...person. Um, she was an outstanding wife and mother. She was... Wonderfully kind, giving, 
She approached every task with an honesty, a freshness, a sincerity, a purity that was quite unique. Just can't get my head around it. Why would anybody want to hurt him? Why? Well, she's never done nothing to nobody. I'm only good. <laughs> It doesn't seem real that she's just gone, just come to work and she's just stuck being killed. My girlfriend's grandmother, she taught her, she taught me, she taught most of my friends, most of my family. She had time for everyone, she was so lovely. She was just unbelievably helpful and she's just a lovely woman. The joy of living her life and the fulfilment of her hopes and dreams and passions have disappeared with this horrific, cruel, senseless and cowardly act. This unprecedented crime in an otherwise unremarkable Leeds suburb took the media by storm. So we're standing here now outside Corpus Christi Catholic College in Leeds where earlier on today a teacher had been stabbed. Paramedics were called uh, just before 12 o'clock this lunchtime but unfortunately after being taken to hospital she was pronounced dead. Anne Maguire was stabbed to death while teaching a Spanish lesson in her Leeds secondary school. She was 61. Her killer was 15 years old. So who was Will Cornick? He didn't look like anyone who would have looked out of place amongst any other group of 16-year-old boys or indeed just walking down the, down the street. Will Cornick came from a loving and supportive family. His parents had separated and he lived with his mother in a semi-detached house and a quiet cul-de-sac a mile from the school. He had never been in any trouble with the police and was amongst the brightest students at Corpus Christi College, passing five GCSE exams early just the year before. Intelligent, articulate, um, very bright, thoughtful, um, and thought about what he said. But this otherwise normal schoolboy had been plotting the murder for months. And in some senses, when someone has committed such a horrifying offence as this, you almost think that they will look a bit different. Um, but he didn't. He didn't. I'm in Leeds, investigating what drove a 15-year-old schoolboy to kill his teacher in a frenzied knife attack in the middle of a lesson. How safe are teachers and pupils from an unexpected act of extreme violence in our schools? I think that a lot of people at school will push the boundaries. You know, teachers have to expect a little bit of bad behaviour, some rudeness towards them. But I never think of that bad behaviour spilling over into extreme violence. It's just not part of the school experience. Will Cornick was a model pupil. Yet he expressed fantasies online about harming his teachers, in particular Anne Maguire. In the words of his classmates, Will Cornick did not hide his hatred of the otherwise popular Spanish teacher. For more than two years, they said he'd been boasting about killing her. Recently, he'd even told one friend that either she must die or he would have to commit suicide. Over several months, his threats on social media turned from hatred into ever more extreme violence and eventually to murder. The thing about social media is it has its good points, but it also has so many negatives associated with it. The problem is, the more we see something, the more normal it becomes. The more desensitised we become to it, the less we're likely to intervene in those circumstances. So whilst it can create, it can also kill. It really can. And we don't take responsibility, we just don't. The amount of negative messages out there that attack people who've done nothing wrong, they might look a certain way, they might have a certain opinion, we almost celebrate it. Will Cornick's obsessive hatred is very dark. It's far beyond something recognisable as an adolescent schoolboy grudge. The level and intensity of angst, anger, uh, and bitterness towards this um, this lady is 
it is out of all proportion to anything and any interaction that may have taken place. On the Thursday before, he had decided and he had resolved that he was going to kill Mrs. Maguire and was giving thought to how he was going to actually commit the act, what sort of weapon he was going to use. He decided on an ordinary domestic kitchen knife, a weapon he could very easily obtain. In January 2016, a knife amnesty by West Yorkshire Police collected 60 surrendered weapons in just 10 days. The dangers of knife crime are well publicised, but many young men still want to carry a knife. John Jackson is an assistant head in inner city London. He understands all too well what can motivate young people to want to carry knives. Uh, in, in my humble opinion, I think there's probably two very different types of people that, that would possibly bring a weapon. Two from school in the community. Um, one would be fear of personal safety uh, and for protection. Um, and the other is almost like a badge of honour. So in terms of uh, police sentencing and all that type of stuff, all the stuff that you would think would be a deterrent, it's probably even more of a carrot it would authenticate that they are as bad as they, they say they are. But Will Cornick was not carrying a knife as a badge of honour. He had a plan to viciously attack his much-loved teacher. He then spent the weekend with his family, behaving outwardly in an entirely normal way. Behind William Cornick's apparently normal exterior was a highly dangerous personality disorder. Personality disorder is often considered sane, but not operating within the confines of moral behaviour. So if you are somebody with a personality disorder, at times you exhibit certain symptoms of your behaviour that is unhealthy for you or for society, but doesn't mean that you can't function. To his friends and family, he was completely normal. Going to a grandparent's birthday celebration, and his father and other family members seeing nothing at all unusual about his behaviour, and yet all the while he had murder in mind. On the 28th of April 2014, William Cornick left home and set off for school like any other day, except it wasn't. When he went to school that morning, he was armed with knives. He'd taken with him a bottle of whiskey with which, as he said, to celebrate in the aftermath. And he was clearly, from the evidence, highly excited about what he intended to do. This was a, a premeditated um, and planned attack. He had taken a weapon with him and he intended to use it. During a lesson, he calmly got up and walked to the desk where Mrs. Maguire was helping a student. Approaching her from behind and attacking her in that cowardly way really doesn't bear thinking about. And then chasing her as she sought to get away, all the while intent upon further violence upon her, stabbed her several times um, uh, and, and then after the attack went back and sat in his seat. This is control behaviour. More than that, he's controlling everybody else around him because he's producing knives, he's threatening his classmates, um, he's thought about what he's going to do and he's, he's got one end in mind and he, and he goes about achieving that end. This was a calculated and vicious attack. As she ran down the corridor, one of her colleagues, in an attempt to assist her, very courageously pushed her into another room and then held the door shut against him. He then returned to his seat and sat down and said, I wish she was dead. Um, chilling. He um, carried out the murder in front of many witnesses, probably as many as 30, 30 children. It is rare for any offence to be witnessed by a large number of witnesses. After he's finished 
killing this uh, poor teacher. He sat back in the class that he came from and he s announced to the class, good times, there was an adrenaline rush. Um, I think there are other observers who said he seemed to be enjoying what he was doing. This isn't somebody who's confused, who's befuddled, who's drugged up or drug addled or drunk. You know, this is something that's happened by somebody who's thinking very carefully about what's going on. Any, any time you hear in the news that, that a life's been taken, um, it's a tragedy. Um, when, when somebody's about their business, doing a hard day's work, trying to empower, impact and, and, and you know, inspire the young, it's even more of a tragedy. When news of the murder broke, the people of Leeds were in a state of shock. And they wanted an explanation. We'd heard a few things coming through, um, through emails and, and from the police, that there was an incident happening at the school. It was very vague initially. N nobody really exactly knew what had happened other than somebody had been injured and somebody had been arrested. At the time, it wasn't, well, we didn't know whether it was a student, whether it was a, a teacher, who it was that was involved. Anna Hodges was one of the first journalists at the school gates. Horrible scenes as we turned up, really. Lots of groups of children, parents, teachers all huddled around, crying. You can almost feel the, the panic, the upset, the sadness. The fact that somebody, that somebody so young, a 15-year-old at the time, has these thoughts and feelings to want to do something to somebody that gruesome is, is hard to comprehend, really. As part of William Cornick's examination, Dr John Kent looked closely at his conventional upbringing. His parents separated when he was very young, and. Uh, he lived his life very amicably, actually, between both sets of parents. Um, I, I met both parents, uh, um, and I reported to court that they were caring, responsible people who'd made it a priority um, to look after the well-being and welfare of the children. There was no doubt about that. Uh, and they were mystified. Uh, they couldn't understand it. He'd recently found out that he had diabetes and he was unable to join the army consequently and had taken a bit of a downhill slope from there. Uh, it obviously it affected him quite a lot more maybe than a lot of people had realised. That is the start of uh, um, his need for treatment, lifelong treatment for diabetes. And that's, you know, I think it's difficult for anyone to adjust to that. Uh, um, it's difficult for adolescents to adjust to it and, and that proved to be the case here. Um, but. As we know, most people do adjust to it in, in various ways. You know, they don't become people who kill their teachers. So that's not the whole answer to this. It's part of something that's uh, uh, allowed him to change at that stage, which is a kind of crucial stage of an adolescent's development. And he became what some of the, the students had said, a, a bit of a loner at school and didn't have many friends kind of kept himself to himself. There's a kind of psychological adjustment. I'm not the person I thought I was going to be. You know, I've got this illness now. Adjustment disorder is when a set of circumstances change, you feel like you're not in control of that change, and unlike the average person being able to transition, not necessarily effortlessly, but without any great psychological damage, it either stunts your progression you avoid the progression by using things like drugs and alcohol, or your behaviour changes to a degree where you can, to some degree, have control over it, such as being highly aggressive. But nobody was aware that Will Cornick posed any kind of real danger to his teachers. To figures of authority, uh, he appeared perfectly normal, whereas to some of his uh, friends at school, he didn't appear normal. He had been storing photos of knives on his phone and became obsessed with violent video games, death and killing. Following an argument with Anne Maguire about homework, he started to brag to his friends that he wanted to kill her, but most of them didn't take his threats seriously. 
in the Christmas just before the murder in April, he was saying to one of his friends on social media he wanted her to be dead. Fifteen-year-old Leeds schoolboy William Cornick hated his teacher Anne Maguire so much he wanted to kill her. His death threats posted online started to get more and more graphic. She was a very kind, loving person. She, she was very good at her job, as I understand, uh, as a Spanish teacher. She got involved in a lot of the school activities. Uh, I think she took some children on skiing holidays. Uh, just the amount of respect that people had for her seemed incredible. Why had he come to focus upon such an exceptional person, such a wonderful teacher, as the subject of his, his hatred? And so we knew that by December of 2013, he was expressing a, a wish to cause serious harm, indeed, to kill Mrs. Maguire. By uh, February, when there was an outburst at, at school, things were obviously starting to become even more serious. A girlfriend, I think, of his as well, who subsequently split up before this had happened, um, had also said that he'd had feelings that he wanted to, to kill her and that she deserved to die. Uh, similarly, two other teachers in the school as well, one of which I understand was pregnant uh, at the time, and he'd shown feelings that he'd wanted to, to murder them as well. I think there'd been a, a difficult meeting between Anne Maguire at school. And it's from there, I, th I think, that his, his destructive, his very negative thoughts, his, um, his thought, oh, she deserves to die, which many adolescents might do as a response to, you know, people they don't like. Oh, I wish they'd die, I wish they'd go away, and, but they don't really mean it. Um, um, but I think he meant it. How can we tell the difference between somebody who says, I want to kill you, and someone who actually does want to kill you because they have some kind of psychopathic disorder? Psychopathic traits are high callous behaviour, low empathy. So basically, you cannot empathise with another person's pain. What makes a psychopath dangerous isn't that they don't have a vocabulary of emotions, it's that it's limited. So if I was stabbing you, I would know I was inflicting great harm because you would be letting me know that. And a psychopath wouldn't register that. William Cornick had psychopathic traits, but actually I'm not entirely sure what that really means. And I don't know how you tell whether somebody is a psychopath. I've come to the University of Oxford and I'm going to take the psychopath test for myself. Testing me is Professor Sina Fazel, a forensic psychiatrist at one of the UK's leading mental health hospitals. How would you know in day-to-day -day life whether somebody is a psychopath? Yeah, but I think it'll be very difficult, to be honest. One way, which is a sort of marker, is that someone's had a sort of lifestyle of, of offending, uh, particularly violent offending, and they don't seem to learn from their behaviours. If, if it's a friend and someone you've known for some years, you might get a sense that you know, this, this person may be quite cruel, may have a very grandiose sense of themselves, uh, never seems to learn from experience, doesn't feel any guilt or remorse about things they've done in the past, and that, you know, you, you, you might feel that that's actually very different from your other friends. Mm. There's not just um, a slight difference, there's actually a, a big difference. Should we have a look at some of the questions of psychopathy then? Yeah. Um, first is glib and superficial charm. You don't strike me as having glib and superficial charm, so I'm just going to oh. put zero there. Grandiose self-worth. Um, you know, self-assured, opinionated, the need for stimulation or proneness to boredom, pathological lying, conning and manipulative, lack of remorse or guilt, shallow affect. So this means that you, you, have, um, um, you have a very limited range of emotions. Parasitic lifestyle, poor behavioral controls, early behavior problems prior to the age of 13, lack of realistic long-term goals, so based on what we've done today, what's your assessment of my psychopathic tendencies? Well, very low. I mean, you know, in the worst case scenario, you know, you're scoring one or two and you need to score 30. 
Can you use this kind of thing to predict whether somebody is going to become a murderer, for example? Definitely not. I think it's it, for something very rare like murder, mm. it'll, 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 it won't predict at all well. It doesn't correlate very exactly with risk. Mm. Uh, it broadly does, but not very precisely. Um, um, and, and so y you end up possibly with, with a label which might be quite difficult to shake off. Professor Fazell clearly isn't comfortable about using the label psychopath. I suppose it's a relief, though, that I have scored low on the test. But we've always had psychopaths in our society. Nature would once have created psychopaths because they would have stood with kings and they would have been murderers for them and had a job in this world. Unfortunately, society has outgrown psychopaths and social, you know, sociopaths, but genetics haven't. So there's always going to be the occasional psychopath and sociopath that's born. Even if Will Cornick had undergone rigorous testing before his crime, it's highly unlikely that any dangerous psychopathic traits would have been identified. One in a hundred people are psychopaths. There is a huge scale. A psychopath is somebody who will repeatedly lie to you, for example, in your office, and you'll know they will, but they really don't care. A psychopath at the extreme is somebody who will charm you and then murder you with a smile on their face. In his pre-trial interview with Will Cornick, psychiatrist John Kent noted that the language he used to describe Anne McGuire was truly shocking. Everything I've done is fine and dandy. I'm glad I've killed her and I wouldn't do anything different. And worse than that, this ability to switch off that emotion led me to my view that there were some sort of psychopathic traits to his personality. We rarely see it like this in clinical practice. Um, this level of callousness, coldness, and almost enjoyment of what had happened and, and, the, and the chaos that he created from this. This isn't about just a grudge between him and a teacher, although that's at the heart of this. This is done in a very public way, in a way that seems destined to maximise distress and probably maximise publicity. This chilling crime massively dominated the news. The boy who's charged with her murder appeared here via video link from the detention centre where he's being held. He's now 16 years old. Wearing an orange T-shirt, he answered, yeah, when asked to confirm his name, which we can't repeat for legal reasons. He didn't enter a formal plea today, but his barrister told the court he has confessed to killing Anne Maguire. Under the full glare of the nation's media, Dr Kent revealed his assessment. Despite a dangerous personality disorder, Will Cornick was fit to stand trial. Prosecutor Peter Mann could start to build his case. Having carefully considered all of the evidence presented to us by West Yorkshire Police, we have concluded that there is sufficient evidence to charge this youth with the murder of Anne Maguire. What sort of a case was this from a, uh, an evidential point of view? In this case, the um, report from the psychiatrist, Dr Kent, was, was pivotal. This wasn't a, this wasn't a whodunit. This was a why done it. But William Cornick's stabbing of his teacher Anne Maguire was not just a one off. In June 2015, just over a year later and only a few miles away, there was another unprovoked knife attack in a class by a pupil. I'm going to meet a teacher today called Vincent Uzama. He survived an attack at the hands of a pupil that almost killed him, and that's just 20 miles down the road from where Anne Maguire was murdered. I want to find out what happened to him, and I also want to ask him what he thinks about the safety of teachers in schools. Vincent. Hi. 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 Nice to meet you. Unable to work since the attack, Vincent has kindly agreed to meet me in another local school close to where he was stabbed. Thank you. Yeah. And so can you talk me through exactly what happened? While I was trying to write down the learning objectives and call up the register, I noticed he had stood up, he left his seat and went towards the door. And the door was very close to my right. So I beckoned him to go back to his seat. 
uh, let me do the register first, then we can discuss about that behavior. He ignored me. So when I turned to write, he was behind me. Mm. So all I noticed is somebody who just hit hard on my tummy. Then I turned around, he pulled his hand out. That's when I, I saw the long knife, almost six inch long, in his hand, you know, covered in blood. And when I, I looked down, see what happened, you know, he was still there with the, with the knife in his yeah. hand, standing, facing me. So when I realized he stabbed me, I called him, so he, did you stab me? Then he ran out of the class. Did the story of Anne Maguire come back to you in that moment? It was very strong in my mind, yeah. you know, just feeling probably it's my time now, it's my turn to, to die likewise, you know. Now that you know that he brought a knife to school the day before, that suggests that he really was planning to attack you. Well, he was on my, on my right beside, behind yeah. me, so he didn't know where the knife was going to. The knife could have gone to my heart, kidney, or other things. It's just my God that really saved me so that the knife did not destroy major organs. Why would somebody attack you? And that's what the question I'm also asking. Why? Yeah. Why? He was telling his friends that he hated this uh, black teacher. He was going to stab this teacher. And is it right, had he called you names? Not to my face, okay. but at the court, you know, because the, the police interviewed the other kids in the classroom and they were testifying mm. that I was boasting in, his, in their presence, you know, calling me ra racist names, all those kind of things. That was way, way harder to hear than I expected it to be. Like, you hear about people getting stabbed on the news and stuff, but when somebody is sitting right in front of you and showing you the, the place in their stomach where this knife unexpectedly went in, it was really powerful, and you could tell for him it's still really raw. There still is no reason why it happened. Vincent just said, I still want to know why me. Unlike Will Cornick, the 11-year-old boy who stabbed Vincent was already known to authorities. He received an 11-year sentence for GBH with intent. It is quite scary. There's probably lots of young people quite tormented, fascinated, you know, fixated on members of staff that, you know, that's unhealthy. Will Cornick was now facing justice for the killing of Anne Maguire. Having been charged with murder, the court was ready to hear his defence. Was he fit to plead? Um, was there any possibility of there being a defence of insanity? And secondly, if not, was there any evidence to show that he was suffering from an abnormality of mental functioning which would have meant that whilst he was responsible for the act, that he was guilty of manslaughter by means of diminished responsibility rather than murder. For the murder charge to stick, Peter Mann first had to get William Cornick a psychiatric assessment. Dr John Kent was called in. It's about starting at the year zero, really, the day he was born, and then trying to understand his trajectory in life. What's he done? Where's he been? What was his life like? What was his childhood like? What did I learn about what he told me about the fence? Firstly, it was, it was done in clear consciousness, and that's very important. I've not come across a case quite like this before. When I read the report of Dr Kent, and saw some of the comments that William Cornick had made about the fact that he had pride in what he had done. He had a complete absence um, of remorse. It was really very chilling. I've never seen that in any previous report I've read about anyone, let alone a 15-year-old boy. Overall, the, the position, to my mind, was very clear indeed that William Cornick is a highly dangerous young man who has a personality 
disorder with what Dr. Kent described as marked psychopathic traits. Following the psychiatric report, it would be up to the court to decide whether Will Cornick would be mentally fit to be tried, not with manslaughter, but with murder. On the 3rd of November 2014, Will Cornick pleaded guilty to the murder of Anne Maguire, which had been witnessed by more than 30 of his classmates. The fact that he'd pleaded guilty meant that there was no need for a trial by jury. It was now in the hands of the judge to determine an appropriate sentence. The judge is at the front. The QCs are in benches in front of them. I'm sat with the police in the furthest bench at the back, and then he's right at the back in the dock. And then the, the, there's a public gallery there, which is full of journalists. As the prosecutor, it was Paul Greedy's task to assist the judge in deciding the length of Will Cornick's sentence. I found opening this particular case, even though just for sentence, one of the, the most difficult experiences that, that I've had as a, as a barrister and as a, as a Queen's counsel. You have to be professional. You have to control your emotions because you're not seeking to influence a judge or a jury by emotion, quite the contrary, but by the cold, hard facts. But that doesn't mean that you don't feel the emotion yourself. When Paul Greeny stood up to read the information about both the nature of the offence, which wasn't in the public domain at that point, and the, the statements that William Cornick made to us as professionals, it, it, I mean, it was people were gasping, I think, at that. I had my back to William Cornick, so I couldn't see him. But I understand from others in, in court that he was impassive. Outwardly, he didn't appear to show any signs of the um, irrational anger which was clearly within him. In a sense, his emotional reaction to what was occurring was hardly surprising given that he had explained to the psychiatrists and psychologists, and I won't use the exact phrase that he used, although I did in court, but he made plain that he could not care less about what he had done, that he could care less about the devastation that he had caused to the family of Anne Maguire, and also the damage he'd caused to other children in his class. He'd said that, to his mind, what he had done was fine and dandy. This boy remarks, uh, things would have been so much easier had I had a gun. Uh, um, couldn't get a gun. But, but there may have been a different outcome. Because of our laws banning the purchase of firearms, we've not yet had an American-style school massacre by a pupil in this country. But is it possible? In my experience, in 15 years, I've, I've had a few young people been uh, alleged to have carried firearms. Um, uh, it, it's very alarming, because some of these, these young people don't have the mental capacity to, to be <laughs> anywhere near firearms or any kind of dangerous weaponry. You know, very volatile. Um, however, you know, they, they somehow managed to get their hands on them. We can learn from history. We can have a look at what it was that made Will Cornick tick. We can have a look at what, why Columbine happened. We can have a look at all of that sort of stuff. And, and, and as reflective practitioners, put something in place. For the community of Corpus Christi School, the only comfort they may be able to draw from this court case might be to understand why the murder took place. Our role is to bring uh, offenders to justice. That process may answer some of the questions that a family may have as to why an offence has taken place, though that isn't the purpose of the criminal proceedings. The purpose of the criminal proceedings is for there to be a criminal trial to decide if someone is guilty, and if so, 
for the court then to impose an appropriate punishment on them. William Cornick showed no compassion for his victim. The lack of compassion is there at the point of killing. There's no empathy with most killings at the point of killing. But then people will come back to it and, and they'll regret it and uh, they'll say something about it. Um, lack of compassion, um, I thought was exceptional. Uh, and I think that marked him out as something quite unique. What, what the law wants is, do they have a recognised mental disorder? Everybody who saw this boy said, yes, he does. In deciding the minimum sentence for a child guilty of murder, the starting point is 12 years. But because this crime was so extreme, the judge had to consider if there were any reasons the sentence should be longer. In this case, the judge decided there were. Will Cornick's callous behaviour and his total lack of remorse were taken into account. The judge determined that the minimum period that William Cornick would have to spend uh, in detention before he could even be considered for parole was 20 years. We welcome the conviction of the person who planned and then carried out this cold-blooded, brutal and cowardly attack. His motive, seemingly some inexplicable hatred of his teacher. Until this, there had never been a case of this kind in the UK. How do you understand how a boy of 15 was prepared to stab his teacher seven times from behind and deliberately to take her life? What made Will Cornick that way? Ultimately, that's what this case is really about. How one damaged bad person can cause harm to so many people. There had been no other killing of a teacher in class by a student ever before. So it was and remains, and hopefully always will remain, a unique case. There isn't an aspect to this case, to that story, that isn't utterly shocking. I was a relatively young journalist at the time, and coming to terms with the emotion and everything that surrounded it, um, it was, was difficult. It's, um, it's not your everyday job that you go in and, and expect to cover such tragic circumstances for, for somebody who just went about their, their, their day doing their job as, as a lovely, wonderful woman, as, as she's been described. In November 2014, William Cornick was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. What you've got to remember is that in 20 years' time, he'll be 35, 36 be a very different person than he is at 15. Um, and it's how that process uh, uh, changes him for better or for worse that will determine how people approach him in the future. Sometime between the ages of 18 and 21, William Cornick will be moved to an adult prison. His case will not be reviewed until 2034. Having identified his psychopathic traits, the question remains, what will prison do to William Cornick? If you score highly on a psychopathy checklist, I'm not sure what people would do about it, um, because w there aren't any agreed treatments. When you look at kids that kill, when they're rehabilitated, they go on to live good lives, become good parents, and interject with society in a positive way. That's the aim of rehabilitation. and. Whilst it might feel like we want to just put them in a room and lock the door and throw away the key, that won't help anybody. Will Cornick is currently one of 16 children in Britain's prisons today, serving indeterminate life sentences for murder. Horrific though this crime is, the murder of Anne Maguire is unique. Our schools are not likely anytime soon to suffer from an American-style massacre. But security, education and mental health provision for young people all need to improve. The increasing number of incidents of violence in the classroom experienced by teachers and pupils can't be ignored. Boys, go. Go. The Soviet Union is ready to invade and Washington State is the first line of defence. Chris Hemsworth prepares the troops for a red dawn next on Five Star.